Welcome, affiliated listeners. We have another amazing episode today. In fact, this is something that was one of the most interesting conversations that I had in a city that I'm going to tell you about is underrated, underrepresented, and now one of my favorites. Um, but it's a super great episode today, guys. Really excited. I'm joined, as usual, with uh, my wonderful co-host, Thomas McMahon, who's looking extra oh, dapper yeah. today. Look at that. He's just in the mood for the Valentine's Day coming up, prepping for love. Um, and hopefully you are all prepping. <laughs> as well. Uh, but the guest that we have today, I'm going to do my best to pronounce his name properly. We have Ken uh, Kenan. Kenan? Ken? Oh, I already did. I mixed up the last name. So, <laughs> so uh, close. yeah. So, Ken is here um, from, you know, he's joining us very late at night um, in Tel Aviv, Israel, uh, which is the amazing city that he's at. And he had, his business does something I'm labeling viral content arbitrage. Super, super interesting. It's not complex to understand, but it is just this amazing pocket of affiliate marketing that is very lucrative. It's challenging, but there's more pockets out there when you get to start thinking creatively about how you could take your skills and make money. And I think oftentimes we get stuck in these very narrow mindsets, but not today. We're going to find the opportunities everywhere if you're looking for it. So hopefully you'll be informed and inspired. Uh, but before we jump into all that, we're going to talk to we're going to talk to you again and learn a little bit more about you and your journey. And how are you doing this evening? Not bad. Not bad, man. Good. Good, man. I love, by the way, I love your, you got the lucky cap for the, the new year behind you. And is that a, like a duck? What is this? What is that uh, thing on your shoulder? What is this thing? This well, looks uh, Maybe it's for American. It's a bit uh, complicated. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that's, that is, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Well, um, a, for the, for the audio listeners, the, is that a Trump floating rubber ducky? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, we, we do something in the company since we started like six, seven years ago. So everyone that go abroad need to bring uh, a gift. And then we have like a huge closet. Now I'm in the meeting room, but basically tons of like toys from each country. And then that's the thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. We should well, that. we'll love that. Yeah, that is that's that's a really good idea. I will say, I'm just going to let simmer that it was a Trump duck for someone's choice for <laughs> in terms of American Next representation. Viral product, Trump duck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, so going back to to so Hen, when we when we first met, I will say it's in an amazing city that you you're not f you're from Israel, but I can't remember if you were from Tel Aviv. Um, yeah, in the past, like. I don't know, I think it's like 12 years I'm living in Tel Aviv. So my adult life is in Tel Aviv. But Israel is pretty small. I grew up like an hour and a half south to Tel Aviv, but still. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and for those that don't aren't familiar with Tel Aviv, I'm sure you may have heard about it. And I know, um, you know, honestly, when I went to go visit, my wife was really nervous because she thought, oh, man, you're, it's, it's war. It's, it's conflict. It feels like a hotbed of violence. It was really her general thought. And I was like, no, I don't think so. I, I went there and I will tell you it was one of the most amazing cities. I never felt that safe in a city before, especially since some of the aesthetics of the city don't look like they should feel safe. But they are incredibly safe. I didn't see anything sketchy. It was just a bunch of really intelligent, successful people. They're all very fashionable, very beautiful, very fit. Um, I felt fat and ugly and stupid. Like just I was like, where am I? Where have I landed um, in this Garden of Eden? Um, but great food, great nightlife, really friendly people, great beaches. I mean, I'm telling you guys, if you have just been wanting to go to an amazing city that you could go with your kids or you could go by yourself and have equally good times, Tel Aviv is the place. And I've best hummus I've had ever was in Tel Aviv. It was so freaking I'm still like so longing for it. So uh, but so anyway, so uh, yeah, yeah. Really. First, thanks for being a great host in your city. Was that? Easy. Yeah, I'm saying you're just telling the truth. So, I, 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 I <laughs> yeah, it is. It is really, really exceptional. So, I encourage all of you to go. And um, with that, though, let's let's talk a little bit Hen, about your your backstory. So, um, you you lived, you moved into Tel Aviv 12 years ago. And for those who don't know, it's this really is kind of a a software and tech mecca of a city. Um, and my understanding, I can't remember the exact specifics, but when it happened, but there was a grant that the um, the government was giving citizens to start do software startups that they almost didn't have to pay back, like risk-free loans. Um, that seems like it developed a lot of great tech companies. Some of the biggest traffic 
companies are well represented in Tel Aviv or start in Tel Aviv, such as a Tabula and Outbrain. So not to sell too much about history that you know much more than I do, but um, yeah, talk to us about your journey and how you got started um, in affiliate marketing, online marketing. Sure. I had like a pretty different kind of start. So I started my life Let's say that we are living in what we call in Israel, the ed tech industry. So there is the high tech, which might be cyber and things like that, but tabula outbrain. And what we do is kind of, we call it ed tech. And I got into this ed tech company as a QA engineer. Uh, so very, you know, boring kind of thing. It was <laughs> interesting in the, in the, you know, it was something new that I learned, but it was pretty boring in terms of what they do. And what they did is like, you know, dealing with installers and back in the day, there was toolbars and extension and all this area. And I was in charge of the QA compliance just to make sure that everything's going uh, well. It's really opened my eyes, uh, but it was a pretty boring job. And next to me, there was like the affiliate division, the people that really pushed it. And on their side, there was always, you know, beers and music and happy and everyone like, you know, and I was living in the cube. So I started to hang out more with them and learn about, you know, traffic, what's going on now, how the hell, you know, this company is even making money. And yeah, it took me like a year to, to, to ditch out the QA and start working for a gaming company in media buying. Uh, so I used to promote like, you know, all sorts of gaming from CPA to, to application leads and mobile content back in the days, it was pretty strong. Are you why I saw endless ads for Clash of Clans and just. Uh, <laughs> my, my, my area was Angry Birds kind of style. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> now, and you're doing that with the, with the ad tech company too, right? The original you're doing quality for, or was it a new ad tech company? Or new agency. I was doing quality. Basically, I was following out what's going on with their installers and what people in, install in their installers. And I was like, it was very interesting. And a lot of kind of in the fraud area where people were installing things like YouTube downloader, if you remember this area, or, you know, WinZip. And in the middle, you were like doing next, next, next. And put in all the checkbox and they were like, okay, they download an extension, YouTube downloader, you were happy, but this YouTube downloader is actually stealing all your ads or details, or I don't know what they're doing on white spaces. So I was like the, the cop that looking, okay, where they downloaded the, the company product and then what they downloaded with them. And then I was like, okay, that's, you know, back in the days, we're like, okay, that's that's the wild west. No one, there is no police. And everyone is doing whatever, and it's really <laughs> opened my eyes of you know you as a user just walking around, and then endless people are doing money uh, during this walk. Uh, so that's really opened my eyes and say, okay, that's an interesting world, and I want to know more about what's going on. So I I bounce from there to a company and learn to do media buying. So learn pretty strong on how to buy on Google and native and lots of different DSPs. Um, and I think it took me another like year and a half to say, okay, I'm doing it alone. And then I started to do like pretty much full stack affiliate things. So I run, I started to run obviously gaming, but then moved to CPL leads uh, and different e-commerce and all sorts of stuff. Um, and yeah, after a while, and I guess like, like everyone else, I used like spy tools to see what's going on, right? So mm -hmm. who's running who's offer? What's going on? And on those spy tools, we always saw next to our ads, someone who ran things like, you know, the best houses around the world and, you know, places you should be. And those days it might be why like your the cat top is- 10 doing list and stuff, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. top 30. <laughs> Ask for the kitchen or why your cat is following you to the bathroom. And I was like, oh. you know, I'm selling, I'm selling like something, $100 CPA. And now someone is competing with me. So that's basically was the area that we say, what's going on? How this, you know, why your cat is doing it can bid more than us in Tabula or on Facebook and what's going on. 
basically this was the light the the ball that like all right that's interesting let's dig more into it uh, and then and then we started to dig more into this model which eventually created shines interesting so yeah I mean first go, to go back a little bit one I think uh just I'm kind of curious when you go to that leap of going and breaking on your own and doing like the CPA stuff, like we, how are you feeling during that time frame? Do you feel like, Oh, I could do this forever. Was it like, ah, this is nice. But you kind of wondered, does it feel sustainable? Am I really enjoying this? Is that what, how do you start getting curious with the, I'm curious at your mindset when you started seeing these, you know, why is your cat follow your bathroom? Which by the way, I don't even have a cat and I would click on that. Cause that just sounds yeah. interesting as hell. So yeah, <laughs> your dog I have is cats. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, yeah. How do I stop it from following? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm kind of curious, like where your head was at during that phase. I think we have a lot of people that are listening that would like to make that leap as well, um, or they're they're in it. And sometimes it's always good to kind of get that state of mind of how are you feeling and, and kind of what led you to that curiosity. Yeah, I think that you know it's kind of a different time now, but I still I still think the mindset will be the same. I was like, all right, people are doing affiliate. I see it all around, you know, I'm signing up for this forum and people are crashing and ClickBank records all around. They're like, all right, if someone can do it, I can do it as well. And I started to dig in and started to do do stuff. And yeah, back in the days, it was, I, I guess, nothing easy, but it was a bit easier because, you know, you can just sign up for endless affiliate network, find the offer, run it in Google, Facebook, no compliance, whatever you can, you, you do. Uh, so it was a bit easier if you were, you know, technical and kind of savvy and pixel oriented and, you know, all this area. But then, you know, I just saw this huge opportunity that People around me, let's say my friends, I was like online marketing, affiliate marketing, CPA. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? All right. There is an opportunity in this area. I'm going to do it. Gotcha. Well, I I just want – I think what's really interesting that I love about – what you're talking about, even with the affiliate stuff, is you saw opportunity and oftentimes people see it and go, cool, that must be for them, not for me, right? We tell ourselves, not for me, not for me. And you had the complete, you're like, why not me? Like, if they're doing it, why can't I do it? I could probably just go figure this out. So um, I, I just really love that because, yeah. I want to amplify that, right? Like, things that I, I learned during the time is that one, if someone is doing it, I can do it as well. Right. If someone solved it, if someone built this Shopify, if someone, I don't know, wrote this code, I can do it as well. And I think maybe I'm, I'm releasing this uh, info a bit too, too, too soon, but I think that what I'm doing best, like what I'm best at is literally searching Google and insisting on solving the problem. It might mm. take me a day. It might take me a week might make take me two months and endless video but if i want to solve it i'm going to solve it and i think that's what separated me from other media buyers when i worked in the gaming shop and other people in general that's all i'm just i'm just stubborn on finding the solution. <laughs> that's good i love that. that's insisting good. on solving the problem i love that yeah yeah, yeah. And here's all the, like oh that the traffic source doesn't work or this tactic doesn't work it's like well, people are doing it, so it works. <laughs> right? you know, yeah. I can do it, man. If someone is doing it, and if I need to learn how to run, uh, how to write a JSON code, or you know, do a small course like that, or just following, like uh, you know, like okay, this YouTube is doing that, and then you're writing that, and I need to change the name that I will do it. And it took it. If I decide that I want to solve it, I'm going to solve it, and that's yeah. that's the thing. Because success is not a measure of lack of failure, just that you get to the end point, right? We have to take a lot of failures to get there. But um, no, I love that. I think I think sometimes that's, to me, that's intelligent resilience, right? A lot of people are stubborn and willing to hit their head against a brick wall as if some something's going to break first, the wall or the head. Um, but but I, I imagine, and we'll kind of go into this more, you seem a lot more strategic about how you're going about that resilience and solving those problems. So so with that, um, we see a really interesting thing. Why are there these, these articles um, or just kind of silly 
silly content, silly, very clickable content um, that is getting a lot of spend. It's outbidding what you're doing at $100 CPA, which makes you pause and go, why? So what did you end up uncovering? You started kind of learning about this and you end up now it's what you do um, is you're the person creating these clickable, creative um, content ads. So so walk me kind of through what you uncovered um, and what you found about this industry and why people are doing it. So, yeah, again, same thing. I'm start I keep running my CPA stuff and on the side, you know, half hour there, two hours there, maybe after work at night. Maybe, I don't know, on Saturday, whenever it's popping into my head, I'm starting to, to, to dig into this area. Uh, me and the partner that we had, uh, that I had, that I still have in, in those days. Uh, and you can see that there is endless website that are doing it. And when you check Tabula and Outbrain, those are companies that literally were built on this type of content, on viral content. And there are more and more companies, part of them Israeli, uh, also a big portion are from U.S. that are doing it. So, again, if someone did it or do it, I can do it. So let's build a website. Let's get some ads in. Let's, I don't know, outsource viral content. Let's scrap or, or you know, just rewrite whatever is going on. Uh, so basically the same affiliate mindset of running any different offers. I was looking at, at it as an offer and it, it took me a bit of time to do this all around thing that, all right, it's exactly the same. There is a CPC, there is an EPC, whatever going on. Uh, at this point we say, all right, we're going to build a website, whatever we can do. I don't know. We did a logo online and then we outsource the content and then we add Google AdSense that were pretty simple. And again, all those small steps uh, all around. Um, and we started to buy traffic. And again, traffic was a bit cheaper the, back then. And then uh, I think we started to see some break even ish. We started to see that we can do something on low scale and we kept digging. And um, at that point, the, the monetization was just that you need to make more on like your EPC um, from AdSense versus your CPC for what you're buying to kind of put the, the, the content out there, right? That's all you were doing? Yeah, so let's, let's try to break it out. So you have your CPC and CTR and whatever niche you're running, you want this to be as high as possible CTR and lowest possible CPC. Um, and again, is in, in like everywhere, if you're going to target a wider audience, your CPC will be higher. So that's one side of the business. And then on the other side, I want people to come. And if I'm doing, you know, why your cat or 30 hacks for the kitchen, let's say 30 hacks for the kitchen, you know, everyone will click on it. And when they come to my website, there is a sweet balance that we need to find. One, our goal is make them stay as long as possible. So if it's 30 hacks for the kitchen or maybe 50 hacks for the kitchen, I want them to read as long as possible. On the other side, okay, so I need the content to be interesting. I need the ad to talk with the content. I need it not to be misleading. From the other side, I want to monetize it. But then where is the sweet spot? How annoying is it when you go to an article and there is way too many ads and you, the ads are jumping your text and you cannot understand what's an ad and what's a text and what's a button. So, you know, you need to experience this side. If it's too much, okay, I'm making good EPC maybe, but then people hate me uh, or not staying as long or bounce too much. If I'm not putting any ads, people are staying a lot of time and read all the pages, but I'm not making any money. So I think the work war was mostly to see where is the sweet spot at any certain time. Like where is, you know, where I can put this amount of ads, which is not too annoying, but still people will like to stay and uh, on the ch on the content and stay as long as possible. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I, I mean, how long did it take you to kind of feel like you were able to feel comfortable that you understood that sweet spot? Because I feel like that'd be tough, particularly starting out. It'd be so hard not to chase that short term EPC and just 
blitzing people with a cacophony of ads because I, I we've all been on that you know we yeah, click to find out why our what our cat's yeah. poop tells us and you know we get blitz <laughs> with ads yeah so, so i think it's part of the, the the journey so again exactly like i had on gaming and doing more aggressive flows and like exactly like i did on e-coms and put you know timers and red pop-up and whatever and that's short term and you don't gain from it so yeah, of course, in the beginning, we were more aggressive. Uh, but then when we understand, okay, we're full on, we're going to go for it, right? So there is risk management and there is, you know, understanding that we are trying to build a business that is a real business. And again, now, maybe six, seven years into it, I can say, finally, yeah, man, that's a business. So I'm, I'm going to jump, like, just for people to understand, Shines now, we own maybe 40 different websites or like few sport websites and travel and entertainment and whatever. Uh, and then we also served our technology and our content and our monetization to other publishers. So now it's a, like a real company that do real content that like every other content website make money from the reds, but in a very balanced way, just on scale. Are you, are you trying to maximize time on page? Or are you trying to do those like, there's 30 things I have to click next to the next page? Are you trying to maximize page loads or kind of time or both? So there is no, this model of gallery is still exists, but mm -hmm. big companies or serious company are not making those anymore. So next, next, next. That's very annoying. No one like it. Not the monetization, not the clients that doesn't exist. So what now we have what we call like infinite, infinite scroll. So basically mm -hmm. instead of next, 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 you scroll down and it's load more blocks. Uh, and yeah, the idea is again to balance out how much time or how many pages they read and we follow up on that. So there is an A-B testing. So what's the first uh, paragraph? What's the first picture? And when do you, you, you we change all the order? And then maybe we put three ads on a page and then maybe four, and maybe we put three and then two and then four. And there is an A-B testing going on all the time. And on the monetization side, think that we don't have AdSense to monetize. So we have AdSense and OpenX and Robicon and other app Nexus. I don't know if any of you uh, out there know those uh, big DSPs, SSPs companies. Uh, but then it takes time to make real content and real website that they will want to, you know, put their monetization on your side. So you need to balance out like 20, 25 different uh, demand partners. So all along the way, there is A-B testing, multiple A-B testing that go all the time and f try to find those sweet spot that, you know, going all around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that. I can imagine the amount of variance that you could have in something like that is huge. And even optimizing, how do you get people to continue on with the scroll um, on that infinite scroll and feeling like, well, that was a great article, but I have to keep watch. I have to read this one now. Or I have to find out this. And next thing you know, you're like two hours on the toilet because you've been going through, you know, <laughs> an infinite scroll of blogs. Um, so what, one thing I'm kind of curious, because a big part of our conversation, you already mentioned this was working with other publishers and now starting to be able to drive and really source out the traffic that you guys do such a good job driving the websites, but doing that specifically with direct publishers um, and kind of how you do that. Can you walk me through kind of that process? Because this is one of those ones that I think my caveat to this is far too often, I think a lot of affiliates play in small ponds, not realizing that the big ponds could be incredibly lucrative. When you start working with large companies that cash flow is never a problem, it really changes the games that you could play. So anyway, I don't want to steal your thunder, but talk a little bit about that. Sure. That's, that's a good point. So at some point we understand that what we specialize on, and again, it's all affiliate mindset, media buying mindset. What we specialize on is paid media to content website, right? So we know how to drive people from Facebook, Tabula, Twitter, whatever, 
to a content website. And then we also know how to monetize those clicks and actually earn money, right? Now, usually big, big website and back in the days where, you know, organic reach on social was very big. Uh, they specialized on making fun content, but then they didn't specialize on analyzing those, you know, clicks and sent and this basically margins arbitrage that we, we do. Uh, and at some point, a lot of those publishers, so I'm going to give an example, one of the biggest um, kind of sports sites on the U.S. say, Okay, whatever we do, we manage to get, I'm just throwing numbers, so don't take it. We manage to get to 50 million users a month on our website, right? So whatever we do, whatever content we do, uh, that's the reach. And now I'm doing Farfetch. Let's say Nike come to them and say, okay, we want to give you budget, not for 50 million impressions, but for 60 million impressions, right? Now, they don't know how to bring those 10 million, that, those extra, but they have the budget. And if they're going to fill the budget out, they're probably going to get a bigger budget next quarter or next year from Nike. So in this case, we have a sport website that have a better monetization from us, right? Better rates of, of ads. And uh, we know how to bring them 10 more millions users a month so we know how to bring to our story or to similar story to funny viral i don't know sports stories 10 million users to their website so in this case we come as a small company and we know how to bring because we analyze those numbers and we know how to bring to their website 10 more millions users and from their side they get you know higher budget and they get more reach and from our side, we obviously get better monetization because they have direct deal. Again, I'm extreming with Nike or with another advertiser that we work with. So yeah, that's definitely an opportunity. And then we started to kind of set ourselves to the mindset of uh, what we called like a audience development. So if you're a website and you go, you get into this glass ceiling and you're a content website, and we know how to analyze which users are coming to a website. We can retarget them with viral content and bring more of those and still making money on the, those small cents. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah and so um, I, I think amazing. And one of the things that, again, like that concept of the budgets of big companies allow for a lot of spending, right? Like they know they need to get through it. They act more like governments than they do small businesses, um, which are very margin oriented um, for them. 3% top line at the overall is great because they're talking in the billions of dollars. It's, it's just a different game. So um, when you could penetrate into that, it could be incredibly lucrative. So I remember, um, you know, at dinner, you were kind of talking about um, when you're interacting with these, these large publishers, let's say the large sports publisher, they need the 10 million clicks. They're going to pay you you know, some amount for the clicks that you send. So then your job is, okay, whatever they're going to pay us, let's get them for less than that. So kind of, kind of walk through what some of those numbers look like. And then also curious, how do you negotiate and reach out to them? How do you know that these deals are happening and then they need you? So we know the range that we, we, we know the range on both sides, right? We know that we can buy or manage to bring user in a, in a certain CPC because we specialize on making content that, you know, uh, that is viral, meaning we, we specialize on creating ads that are go viral, that, you know, the CTR is very high and the CPC is very low and the share comments area is very big. So we know, and again, just just to throw numbers, we, we know that we managed to buy, I don't know, on Facebook in five cents CPC for mobile traffic, right? And then we 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 just analyze what they get. So they're gonna get us, I don't know, flat CPM on a certain ad unit. And we will need to check the data. So exactly like like everyone else, we will drive traffic, our best traffic to I don't know stories that we know, uh, and we're gonna get this feedback. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try to to go more into it. So think that we will work 
all the demand that all the monetization that's going on is going on in real time. So when you go to any site, the content site, most of the time is real time bidding, meaning that you know the the ad doesn't appear in advance. So it gets you. So Kyle is going to into one of our website, and then we have a lot. We don't have a lot of data, but everyone get a lot of data. So I don't know, you sign it to Google. So Google know that's Kyle and he's uh, 18 years old, right? Um, and I don't know, they, maybe they know you're about to take a mort- mortgage or buy a car or whatever. So they send all this information. They know if you're from US, whatever. They send all this information to all those SSPs, all those demand partners that bid in real time, who is going to show you the impression, right? So we have like, I don't know, 20 different auctions uh, that, that bid on you. Then we analyze who bid the highest and he will serve the ad. Now we're going to bring Kyle and we're going to bring other people and we're going to see who is getting the biggest CPM or the highest CPM bid from, again, to extreme it, from Nike, from Volvo, from a brand, right? And then we're going to try to retarget people like you on Facebook. So it's not that we're only going to bring very cheap clip, clicks. We're going to bring very cheap clicks that is target to what the brands want. And we're going to work with this circle all the time. So again, I'm trying it sound, maybe it sounds complicated, but it's exactly what you do as an affiliate marketing. It's exactly what you do as a media buying. Right, so we just do this retargeting in a very high macro level, but that's exactly what we do. So, again, we're gonna analyze who be the highest, what the bid they bring, and what user we're gonna fire to Facebook, we're gonna fire to Tableau, and we say, okay, find me more Kyles, right? And don't find me more heads because we get a very bad bid. <laughs> and because it's a viral, viral article, because you will click on 30 hacks for the kitchen. I will click on 30 hacks for the kitchen and my mom will click on 30 hacks for the kitchen. I'm going to find the right person to the right demand partner to the right monetization all the time in real time, multiple times a yeah, a minute uh, across the web. Yeah. I was Go curious ahead. on that part because you, you alluded to it there. Like when you're making this viral type of content, we're talking a lot of like the ad spend for it but do you factor in the viral component to it, right? Because you must get a decent amount of just organic, I guess you'd call it traffic, traffic from shares and kind of people cross-posting it and things like that. Yeah, but the, the paid media is out, like, win it. So, mm-hmm. again, we work in such a huge scale in paid media. Um, we might bring, like, three to five million users a day to our websites, across all websites. Uh, so even if if it's organic, it's even if it's one hundred thousand people organic, it's a very small percentage, and eventually doesn't doesn't make like a big difference. Gotcha. And, no, that's what I was curious about. Was that kind of ratio? So if it's kiltered one way or the other, if it's more fifty fifty, but it sounds like it's majority ad buying, yeah. and then the rest is kind of like okay, that's Again, cool, but you're not factoring that into it. As an ad, you you can reach to much more people if you spend the the, the money on it. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. It makes me wonder what, what viral content is actually purely organically viral. I think it's probably a much smaller percentage than we ever realized. <laughs> so um, now speaking of the viral content, just I one think, last I question. Think I think, oh, any viral content you can leverage with paid media to make it much more viral. Right. Mm-hmm. And again, yeah. make more, much more money out of it. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds, don't, yeah, don't it sounds like the, do you go straight to ads though? And then you kind of, it kind of goes viral after you've optimized it for the ads. Yeah. So we're going to, um, we're going to do multiple testing for uh, everything and see which one of them get the best results. Well, yeah, that, that goes perfect. Cause the last thing I wanted to just talk about here is it, I think one of the big things that people are always looking to make things more clickable. How can you get people to click in and target audiences to click and pay attention to whatever I'm creating. We see it a lot with whether it's sales pages, but oftentimes your own ads or um, email creatives, Um, getting good creatives that will draw people in and make them move their index fingers um, in the way that we want them to um, is, is sometimes really challenging, but it is the backbone 
with media buying, right? But the backbone is you have to have some of that content. So walk me through, you mentioned you outsource a lot, but how do you go about, um, you know, creating this viral content so consistently um, to, to get all those eyeballs to web pages? So at the moment, it's obviously it's much less outsources. So we have like a huge team of, of content writers that, you know, and a huge team of product team that just go around the net and see what's going on and try to, to mimic or try to understand all right, it's very trending because it's a holiday season. It's very trending because, you know, all right, royal family, right? I don't know, the queen die or the Megan and uh, whatever, they uh, they got married. So immediately, again, like any affiliate, we're going to create not one viral article about Megan and whatever, the prince. Harry? We're going to make yeah. Yeah, 15 different articles about them. And then... On those 15 different articles, we might create, I don't know, 50 different ads to each one of them, right? And then, again, it's, in, it's on scale, so it's easy for me to talk, but we're going to get a lot of data very fast, and we're going to try to understand what to focus on. So um, on those 15 articles, let's do the Harry and Meghan thing, you know. You know, you're going out and you have, you know, Harry and Megan sex cult and Harry and Megan, whatever. You start doing all your weird articles, um, not weird articles, but your your viral stuff. Of that 15, how many will end up becoming like the the winning? Like how many will you actually scale um, maybe, from all those ads? 10, 20 percent out of all what we do will scale. So that, I mean, that's, that's big, right? Cause I think a lot of people feel like, Hey, if I write one, that'll be enough, maybe two, but knowing that only 15 to 20% of all the content you create actually goes viral. I think yeah. that, that even feels pretty high given your experience. Yeah, yeah. You guys are probably doing <laughs> better less. than most. Yeah. 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 Even less, uh, probably less. Uh, but again, in, in, in our case, you don't know when something will catch fire. So we might try something now, and in a year and a half, someone will try it, and you know there will be a new season, or there will be something happening again. On uh, all right, there is a new season of Megan and uh, Harry in Netflix. Right, that's you know that's the the other article that didn't work might work now. Uh, so we know it's not going to the trash. Uh, and then we're willing to take the risk because it's enough that one of those 15 will catch fire and suddenly it's creating a million dollar in revenue and yeah, was worth the risk. <laughs> so um, I really do the, the idea of, I think viral makes the most sense on seasonality or what people are talking about, right? So how do we take the target audience? So if you're doing sports, it might not be Harry and Megan, uh, but it might be something on gambling, right? Like some sort of gambling oriented thing or um, NIL or something like that, right? There's going to be lots of different subjects, but you're looking at viral news and things like that and say, great, let's take that trend in our target demos and start writing content for it. And I love that because that, that's a shockingly underutilized thing, I think, in a lot of swipes and creatives and affiliate marketing. Let me give you an example. And th did you guys saw uh, Michael Jordan, the less dance mm -hmm. thing on Netflix? You saw it, right? So we are all right. We're sitting on you know, a, a meeting, lunch or whatever. And then we talk, ah, yeah, the less, just, the less dance, amazing. Wow, did you see that? And then someone said, yeah, but why does his eyes are red or yellow, right? Why does, right. what, right? Now, you saw it and you had this like passing in your head and you saw it and you had it as a night. And I saw it and it's passing my, like, what in Michael Jordan? What's going on with your eyes? And then, boom, man, that's the best angle you can have. So I think if you manage to, see things and catch this little thought, right? This little thought that everyone had it, but then no one is like saying it. That's the thing. So whatever you see a product, whatever, like since then, whenever I see something, I like try to see or think on, you know, what's passing to everyone in their mind and they don't say it or they don't talk about it like loud. And that's, that's the viral thing. That's, I think, if I can catch it. That, that's a great, I think, summary kind of 
how you can it's almost like the underlying zeitgeist right of this of this general content because we're kind of out of the era of the beatles right where everyone listens to the same band everything's very fractionalized but there are those things that have the big niches that get the right reach that have that little bit of what if what about what about right it's kind of that huh do you so when you when you are creating this content how does your are you in this kind of like, I mean, that sounds like it was just kind of this little idea that popped off, but like, are your writers, is your content team, are they having brainstorm sessions? Are they more siloed? Like, how, do, how does that work on the floor? I think that, you know, like, again, it's a progress that we had in a few years. So whatever we did like five years ago, it's not what we do now. Now we understand it's a numbers game. And I think that, again, I'm going to, uh, we still run, like, personally, I'm still into other niches and other verticals. And. You know, whatever you're going to do, if you're going to test more, you're going to find more win there. With every, any, like, there is no type of, yeah, I know this creative will kill it. So I want to test this creative and that ugly creative and that different creative and what other people are doing. And, you know, I don't know, reverse the creative. I want to do everything. And I know you need a budget for them, but you don't need a huge budget for any, anyone any creative so like early days i understand that if you know your numbers good enough you can test a lot of things on a very low budget and still predict better on what you should invest on so yeah i think that's, that's an that. investment right you're investing in the data to see the signs of life and you're killing what doesn't have signs of life or <laughs> right and then you're yeah, yeah. No, going it's, up it's from there very, yeah the very type of you know media buyers thingy. So I have a friend is like a designer. He's doing logos, and every logo is taking a like you know I don't know few days to make, and all those small. And I like ah, you know let me do like twenty logos, and then I'm gonna come back <laughs> to you in a week and I'm gonna say that's the best one, you know. So yeah, definitely more data, more scale. And you're going to test more, you're going to get more information. But as a side note, I think that you need to understand your numbers and you need to understand your data very good uh, in order to predict where you should invest your money. But in the test phase, you need to test as much as possible. Yeah. No, I strongly agree with that. It's hard to under test right when you're kind of trying to get something to pop and, and whatever we're whatever, talking a cpa campaign or a you know traffic and a viral campaign here i'm curious like well so i've got one more question for you while we wrap up but i did want to give you a chance to like, where can people go to learn more about you or your brands that you operate or like where can people find out more about what you're doing i'm going to give some plugs and some social links where wherever whatever you want to do here this is your chance sure i think that facebook and you know instagram will be the best to hear of me uh, again, I'm not a savage on social, but I then whatever going on with the company is usually an update there. If it's more professional and companies that you know more interesting on see how we can help them, so definitely LinkedIn will be the more professional thing. But IG or Facebook, I'm available there and I'm very active usually there are conferences and things like that on what's going on. Uh, but yeah, conferences, if there's anyone around and you see me, please reach out. Nice. What, what are some of the upcoming conferences you'll be at? I'm going to go next to Affiliate World in Dubai, mm -hmm. uh, which will be in the beginning of uh, March. Uh, we're going to also do a very nice uh, an event. So we're doing a closing party there for the second time. Oh, uh, sweet. So yeah, everyone is welcome. And if you, you're going to be in uh, affiliate work. I won't be at Dubai. I'll be in Barcelona. Um, I'll still be at the Barcelona event. Yeah, then, I, uh, I'm a sucker for affiliate world uh, conferences. Basically, I used to go to affiliate summits every year. And after I found out affiliate world, uh, I, I just keep going to all those door, <laughs> door conferences. And it's a very they are good. Yeah family wise uh, kind of atmosphere and networking very good vibes so yeah definitely recommend it awesome no i'll hope i'll see one of them coming up i think we've got three people going to philly world to buy and then a bigger team going to barcelona um and i was curious for the last question here we'll uh, we'll include all your social links that you're comfortable sharing in the show notes and the description for anyone watching or listening to this 
Uh, I was curious on how the creative team and the media buying team are working together there. Cause I imagine that has to be pretty synergistic. Yeah. So to be honest, like this is, we have two things. So for years we were working where the media buyers were only also doing the creative. So again, this feeling of what's going to work and when it's work, how to scale, we were giving them the freedom of, you know, creating their own creative. Uh, as a process, I think in the past two years, we started to, to get more creative people and they are literally just, you know, reading an article, thinking about different angles and they are uploading it for the media buyers. And the media buyers, you know, just look at the data and decide if to scale it or, or pose it. So basically, again, you know, they gave the, they give them MO all the time and the, the media buyers will, you know, skirt around the net and will find their own MO. Um, and again, there is an, a, a push to upload as many creative articles, angles as possible all the time. Uh, There's in, an algorithm kind of <laughs> find what works, right? Yeah. 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 And then, you know, kill whatever doesn't work really, really fast. Uh, but obviously we upload much more than what we scale and we kill again, probably similar numbers, like 90% of the ads will be killed in 24, 48 hours. And then maybe. Oh, that quickly. Will... Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, gosh, that, well, man, thank you for sharing like kind of what's a different view. I think than most people in our, our direct space here at ClickBank kind of have in the affiliate space, right? They, I think you've shed a lot of insight into the, not just the what if of the content, right? But the what if, if you just kind of expand your ideas and kind of different monetization strategies, um, right? I've seen people bridge both. They'll kind of have their CPA campaign running or collecting leads on that potentially. They're remonetizing re -monetizing those leads in a variety of different ways, sometimes with arbitrage, sometimes with CPL, whatever it might be, right? It's like, there's a lot of ways to, you know, squeeze the blood from the stone, if you will, in this space. And I think you've, you're, it sounds like you're doing an amazing job at rising the tide for you and your brand and a lot of different avenues. Thank, thanks for the feedback. Yeah. I'm happy to hear yeah. and I'm more than happy that if anyone got some inspiration to look around and see what's going on and again, to catch those type of thought that he have from, you know, how to create better content to what's going on in their space or what people are running around them and, you know, how to utilize what people do in on viral content or on application or on promoting leads on your CPA offers. So there is always opportunity to find and yeah, just look for it. I will keep looking for it and I trust you do too. And Kyle will too, but his laptop died. That's why he vanished into nowhere. So, <laughs> so um, it's a mystery. yeah, he's Maybe a mystery. Yeah. To Tel Aviv now, so don't worry. That's right. <laughs> Who gets a better internet out there, better tech out there. Um, but and I always like to wrap it up by saying happy scaling to you, you know, and uh, thank you for hopping on to Affiliated here to share your insights. I really appreciate your time. And I trust that our listeners did too. And they go find your socials and can check you out and keep abreast of what you're doing. And I'm excited to meet you. Hopefully I can meet you in Barcelona, if not before then. Um, and happy scaling, man. And if anything else you'd like to share, do it now. But really appreciate your time. I'll just say thank you for having me. Well, thank you. Cheers, man. <laughs>